Um, tonight, if you'd open your Bibles, um, I only have a few scriptures to share. Uh, I feel like this is getting back to our 20-minute remote services when we, we didn't preach long. But I've said that before, and then it's gone long, so forgive me if I'm wrong. I, hopefully I'm right this time. But I'll tell you what, God isn't interested in quantity. He's interested in quality. Um, I can't promise you quality either, so. <laughs> Psalm 70, chapter 73 and verse 26. Psalms chapter 73 and verse 26. And, and really it's this first portion of this verse that we're going to focus on. But reading verse 26, my flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart Amen. and my portion forever. This flesh fails. Right. This heart, our emotions fail. Failure is inevitable if we're in this flesh. Right. The Bible just said it. It's true. My flesh and my heart fails. But God, he never fails. And if we rely on the strength of ourselves, we will fail. But if we rely on the strength of God, well, his strength never fails. So would you pray with me one more time that God would speak to our hearts and our minds tonight? Jesus, Lord, I, I ask that your anointing would be on this pulpit tonight, that your words would be true, God, that your spirit would move in our hearts and our minds, God, and that your perfect will would be done. Through it all, it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God uses failures. Um, as some of you may have noticed or known, uh, I've, I've been out of town for a few days. And uh, yesterday, in fact, was the first day I came back. I had just returned from a trip to Wyoming. Um, I wouldn't call it a vacation, I'd rather call it an adventure because a vacation implies rest and relaxation and, and there was very little to none of that. But throughout this adventure, I, I, I even tried to journal some of my experiences and towards the end I noted in my journal that I really need to learn how to actually take a vacation that is a vacation. I had 10 days of this adventure and in 10 days I covered 3,300 miles. Um, to give you perspective, that's about 320 miles a day if I divided that equally amongst 10 days. And so that's like driving to Minneapolis 10 times in a row. Now, looking back, it was my optimism that probably got me into trouble like it, it often does. I, I had a framework and a plan of where I wanted to go and when I wanted to be there and how long I needed to have or how much time it would take to get from place to place. And my plan was actually to be gone 13 days, but the trip ended shortly uh, as I decided to cut it down to 10. And a, a week ago when I left on Thursday, my plan was to actually start off with a, a seven day tour. I was gonna explore the back hills of South Dakota and then do a loop through Wyoming, uh, hitting Yellowstone and Teton National Park. And then that would lead me back to the Bighorn National Forest where I'd meet up with brother Nathan Thompson of Man Up Adventures. And then after seven days of that, I would go through a four day backpacking trip which would have ended today, so I'm obviously not on that trip. And then I would have taken the next two days and, and driven home, so that would have got me back late Tuesday night or possibly Wednesday morning, depending on how I was feeling. I've been planning this trip for almost 10 months. Uh, I've, I've considered the distance between the mountain ranges that I wanted to visit. I, I specifically was looking for sections of, of mountains that had uh, public land use, where they often have off-road trails. Uh, you know, I feel necessary here to maybe give you a little bit of the backstory that led up to this trip. See, I was 11 years old, uh, this was 34 years ago, when my father took our family on an adventure in an RV across the western United States. He was a school teacher, so he had summers off. And so for seven weeks, we, we toured the US and did a giant loop. On that trip, we saw many glorious, wonderful sights uh, that are here in this country, uh, things that God has created in our midst. 
And when we got to Colorado, there was a, a special event that took place. My dad rented a Jeep. I think I've shared some of this story before. He rented a Jeep and we, we took it through the mountain trails. Now there's all sorts of roads cut through the mountains that came from the mining industry. And now they're made available. Most of them are available to public use, but you need a four wheel drive vehicle to access them. You wouldn't want to take your sedan through that. It wouldn't get very far. And as I was on that trip at 11 years old, there was something about the mountains that just captured my attention. It almost became like a magnetic pull in my life. In fact, when God revealed himself to me here, I was planning to move to the mountains to Salt Lake City to be, become a ski bum. That was my pursuit in life at the time. But God had different plans, and uh, I've, I've remained a Midwesterner resident ever since. But growing up as a young man, I always dreamed of owning one of those four-wheel drive vehicles. Uh, as, as early, even before I had my driver's license, there, there was aspirations for a Jeep. Um, and there was desires for one of those classic Toyota Land Cruisers. For, uh, I had many vivid dreams of driving a full four-wheel drive, full conversion van called a Sportsmobile. It's in the upper echelon of the, those vehicles. But then in 2007, Again, so another part of the backstory. When Toyota announced that they were releasing uh, a re-release of the FJ Cruiser, the excitement in me got all excited again because now I had a job, I had a paycheck, I had a family, a young family, and they, they advertised this new truck as an a entry-level 4x4. So 20, I think 28.9 was the, the base price. So before they even came out, I put $500 down at the dealership here in Racine Sight unseen, you know, hoping to reserve my spot like they, I think they're doing for the Bronco right now. And so time went on and, and the FJ Cruiser hit the lots and I took my seven-year-old son, we went to the dealership and it was, it was like, they, should, they could have been selling tickets, we would have paid the price of admission to test drive that car. It was so exciting. And then we found out that all of the vehicles on the lot came fully loaded. And so they were all 39, $40,000. I mean, I was already stretching it quite a bit at 28, nine. And so that year we ended up with the Camry instead. Yeah, a, a far stretch from my dreams and aspirations. It was a good car. It served its purpose, but. And so it was four years ago. Okay, so my dreams have been dashed, right? We have the Camry. I know. <laughs> Time goes on, uh, I think it was 10 years later, 10 years later, four years ago, um, it's time to get a new car. I start looking at used FJ Cruisers and the door opens up and here's a FJ Cruiser, I've had it for four years. You know, dreams do come true, thank you Jesus. You know, I, I'm sure it's not the important stuff in life, but it, it, you can see, you see how far back this story goes, like it, it, it started 30 plus years ago and has still been coming to fruition and and is still to a degree coming to fruition. And so since acquiring that vehicle, um, I've learned how to maintenance it. I never did that before. I, I've learned how to, to modify it. I've added all sorts of additional uh, enhancements, gave it a lift kit that, that raises the frame up so that the, the shocks are for, pushed down further so that you can put bigger tires on. And so I got the bigger tires, the meteor tires, the off-road tires. Uh, got a roof rack, got some lights, got a rooftop tent. And so I've been, I've been equipping this. Yes, there's nods from the front pew. I've been equipping this. Amazon has been delivering precious goods for my FJ for, for a number of years now. You don't do it all at once. You do it little bit by little bit. And there's a long list of things yet to come. Just giving you a heads up. Because... You know, a stock FJ is still pretty capable, but you can make it more capable, right? right? If, if you get bigger tires and you raise up the vehicle, you can go over bigger rocks. That's the, that's the gist of it, right? So it's been part of my plan and goal all along to, to fully equip it. And it was last year that uh, my son and I actually got the opportunity to go out to Colorado in that vehicle. And, and do some of those trails through the mountains. And it was an amazing trip. We had so much fun um, exploring. You know, we, again, we kind of had a plan, but we didn't have a complete plan. And it ended with a trip 
with the Man Up Adventures, and so then we did some hiking, and that was great, and God moved, and it was, it was an awesome time. But this year, um, my son and my son-in-law went on their own Man Up Adventure um, earlier this summer, and uh, they had a great time. And so as a result, I, I planned to, to participate in a, in a separate event, right? So they were going to uh, one that happened, I think, at the end of June. I was planning to go on one that ended today. But now, because he was going there and I was going to a different one, it became a solo venture, right? I, I wasn't going with anybody. And I had some intent around that, I think, to accomplish some things that we didn't accomplish in Colorado last year. So it wasn't because I just didn't like company or, or didn't want to include him, but um, I really wanted to camp in the wilderness, and I'm not sure he was comfortable with that quite yet. See, what I, what I recognized when I was 11 years old that when we were driving through these mountain trails is that this is public use land. Like, you can just set up your tent and stay there. And the law says you can stay there up to 14 days, and then you have to move, I think, so a mile or two. And then you can set up your tent again, so you could perpetually live in the mountains if you wanted to, if you could handle it. And I just thought, this, this is great. You can go anywhere you want. You can do whatever you want. You can set up your tent wherever you want. And you, you're in this majestic setting of the mountains and the valleys and the streams and the rivers and the lions and tigers and bears. <laughs> and so ever since I was 11, I wanted to do that. And we didn't do it last year. And so on this solo venture, I, I had, had intended that I would find these opportunities. And you actually see them as you're driving down the trail. A lot of times they actually are kind of they're not, no one, well, somebody created it and then somebody else parked there and then somebody else parked there and eventually they kind of, you know, a path gets worn in or you can make your own path if you want. It's public use land. And so when I went on this adventure, it wasn't just about experiencing some of those things like camping in the wilderness. I also had a very strong intention to, to get a word from God. You know, I, I know it seems strange that I would go alone, but it was by design and that I knew by myself I would have more time to, to speak to God. I would have more space to, to listen for God, to respond, to, to reflect on oneself, by oneself. I mean, there's nobody else to talk to. Well, there was this fly that was traveling along with me for a while that couldn't seem to, I couldn't seem to get rid of, and so I talked to him a little bit, but mostly I talked to God. I think driving by myself, I, I probably listened to 20 plus sermons, so I, you know, I, I also, I guess that was a conversation in a way. But I, I, it was part of my design that I wanted to go alone, I wanted to experience some things, and I wanted to get a word from God. I wanted to have freedom to just whatever the schedule did, would do. And I really felt like I needed to hear a word from the Lord. I needed a, a confirmation, I needed some direction. In fact, this coming week as we go to youth camp, um, that is the theme getting a word from the Lord. Because hearing the voice of God or getting direction from God or getting that prompting from the Spirit of God um, isn't limited to a certain age requirement or status or role or title. If you've got the Spirit of God living in this temple, well then you're equipped with everything you need to get a word for yourself. And we should ourselves be seeking that. And so the, that's a little preview of what we're going to be working towards in our youth camp this week. So as I hit the road with this goal of adventure and time with the Lord, um, wouldn't you know it, it was like the very first day. I, I, I get out there, I set up camp the next morning, I wake up, have a time with the Lord, and I tell him what's on my heart, and he gives me the answer. He just, he, I get the word, I'm like, well, God, we just got started here. I've got 12 more days to go. We were going to get to the mountaintop with man up, and then there you were going to shine down your glory and, and reveal to me the secrets that I, I part of me actually said at that moment it's like well that's it we're done we don't have to we, we can turn around but that was the part the spiritual part of me the adventure part of me said well we haven't even gotten started yet and so we went on and it was it was even that morning a very powerful presence of God you know I'll go back to it, it it's not the quantity of our prayer it's the quality. And, and sometimes, I'll just speak of myself, fall into that routine of it's a schedule. It's a thing I do, and, and I, I punch in and I punch out, and then I go home and I move on with my day. But in that setting, there was no schedule. There was no next thing. It was just, I'm just, God, I'm here. I'm talking to you. 
And then he responded, and it was almost profound. I was almost unexpected. So as the, as the adventure continued, I, um, I was excited for what God was already doing and how it was working. And that first day, um, as I explored the Black Hills, I eventually uh, followed trails. And there's trails all over the Black Hills. Um, much of it is gravel road, but then some of it isn't gravel road. Some of it's that off-road. And so you can weave back and forth through these trails. You can get close to Mount Rushmore and then... Eventually, I found my way to, uh, across the South Dakota border into Wyoming. So Wyoming's ultimately my destination. And coming out of those trails, I got back on pavement eventually and, and drove another hour, I think hour and a half, to um, the mountains, the first set of mountains, uh, the Bighorn National Forest in Wyoming. And so here it is late afternoon. I found my way in the mountains. And, and um, the first night, I actually did stay at a campground because uh, the Black Hills didn't have quite as much... Uh, public use land or I wasn't quite ready to, to like dip my toe in the water of just camping wherever. And so I did find a campground that first night. The second night I drove into the Powderhorn or Bighorn National Forest. I arrived kind of late. And as I'm driving through this gravel road through the mountains, there's campsites all over the place that people have carved out. But again, just public use. You don't pay to use them. You just, it's, it's public use land. It's a different concept. Like that doesn't exist in Wisconsin, at least not, maybe up north, I'm not aware of it. There might be, a, yeah, there is some public use land. Uh, I guess like a uh, long recreational area you could technically consider public use, but they won't let you just camp anywhere. So a little bit different. So I'm on this gravel road, I'm finding all these campsites, but I'm looking for something a little bit more remote. And so eventually I come up to this road that, that looks like on the map it ends in a dead end. And so I, it's an, it's an off-road trail. Not any vehicle could travel this one. And so I follow it to the end and, and it ends up on this hill overlooking this beautiful scenery of the mountains. I said, this is it, this is my first campsite in the wilderness, you know, away from everything, set up camp. And I'll tell you, I was a little nervous, right? This is, this is where bears roam freely. Um, I didn't see any in my campsite, praise the Lord. Um, in fact, I, what I did see was a lot of cows. They, they let cattle graze all over these mountains. And so you really have to actually watch out for cow dung more than you have to watch out for bears. But, you know, the, the element of, of risk is still there. And so um, eventually with my can of bear spray and my 10 millimeter on my side and a, and a big flashlight, I, I found a way to fall asleep. And the next morning we went on and, and continued to find amazing off-road trails. Um, you know, again, a lot of them are gravel and it's, it's not exciting, but it's beautiful scenery. But then once you find one that's a little bit more aggressive, not as smooth, then it becomes exciting again. And so finding a lot of these exciting trails. Um, and then by the end of the day, I finished the Bighorn Mountains and now I'm progressing west um, towards Cody, Wyoming. And there's a, a, another set of mountains called the Snowshoe National Forest. In between the mountains though, is there's just a dry, flat wasteland. It almost, it's very unappealing. In fact, you'd be surprised to find out that there are more people in the city of Milwaukee that, than that live in all of the state of Wyoming. And I'm not surprised because much of it doesn't feel very inhabitable. And so you go through these vast um, scenery changes from these giant mountains to these dry valleys to these strange looking hills to then another set of mountains. And so now I'm into what is my third set of mountains, a different set of mountain ranges. And I, it's getting late, so I find my way uh, from a trail again, just found a campsite that kind of looked like it was established, opened my tent on the roof, slept for the night. It got a little easier the second night. I wasn't quite as nervous as I was the first night. Um, and as time went on, I, uh, I continued along the trails, following the maps, and you know, you have a little success and then that, that get, builds some confidence and so you, you go for a little more and then that builds some confidence and you stretch yourselves a little bit further. And um, what does the Bible say that comes before is it destruction or a fall? Pride. pride, that's it, yeah, pride. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so it was with this growing confidence or pride that I set off with excitement to conquer what is called Morrison's Jeep Trail. Morrison's Jeep Trail is a well-known off-roading trail. And as I approached this trail, it, it was a spectacular view. It's in this valley. Um, 
these rocks just shoot up on both sides. There's a river that runs through it. And so um, as, you, as you enter the trail, it starts off really mild, just with some rocks and bumps, and it follows the river almost three miles, probably close to four, uh, before it, you get to then the sign that says, and let me read it here. Beware of the following trail is very steep. It's a narrow shelf rock road with 28 tight switchbacks that zigzag up the side of the canyon. Once you enter this trail, there is no turning back because there is no room to turn around. Confidence said, oh, I know that. I've read that. I've researched this. In fact, I've researched all these places to a certain degree, and I've watched videos. That, you know, people do these trails, and they post videos, and I watched it, and I was like, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Especially after I did that one and that one and that one, right? You start to build up this confidence, and... You know, I, I probably would have researched it further, but most everywhere I was, there was absolutely no cell phone signal. Yeah, so get in trouble, who do you call? I had a backup plan. I had a satellite device that I could text or send an SOS message. And so I was able to text my wife back and forth the whole time, even I didn't, didn't have cell service. That was for you, honey, and for my safety. So I had a backup plan, but um, you can't Google Morrison's Jeep Trail to, to do further research. Had I been able to do that, I probably would have changed my mind, but again, building on my confidence of the last few days, I, I, I pushed forward and set off to climb the side of this, this canyon wall. And so a switchback is, is, a, is a tight turn that basically is like a zigzag. It goes zigzag up the side of the mountain, up the side of the mountain, and every turn is well, it's enough room for a vehicle, one vehicle. The road is enough room for one vehicle. Um, in fact, in some places, it's almost not enough room for one vehicle, but you, you kind of ride up on the side of the wall and keep going. It was a slow process to climb this wall. It was, uh, it was very steep. The rocks were bigger than I had experienced before, but um, I did the first switch back and was like, well, that, that was something exciting. We'll do another one. And, that was something exciting, and, and then I realized, oh, there's, there's 26 more of these to go. <laughs> and somewhere as, as, as I was going, it was a slow process because I would even get out, you know, I'm by myself, so number one, don't do this by yourself. I just, I would, let me just say, don't do this particular trail ever. <laughs> Especially don't do it by yourself, because um, it would be great if somebody else was there so they could spot where your tires are on the rocks as you're trying to maneuver. So I would get out and I would survey the scene and I would you know, figure out where I was gonna go and, and sometimes I would even pick up rocks and move them around and so I was grooming the trail a little bit to, to level out some spots because when you go over these bigger rocks, you, you have to make sure that your tire isn't gonna, you know, or your, the rock isn't gonna hit the frame and keep your tire from touching the next spot of ground. And so you need to have a short wheelbase, you need to have big enough tires in order to maneuver this. So some vehicles, even if they have awesome four-wheel drive traction, wouldn't be able to do a trail like Morrison's Jeep Trail simply because they're too big. And so they'd always get hung up somewhere along the way. So it was a slow process, but I, as I conquered each switchback, I grew a little more confidence. And it was about halfway through the initial climb that failure entered. See, there was this sizable boulder on the passenger side that was on the hillside closest to the hill and um, again, this road is a very narrow road. There's just enough room for a vehicle. And so you, you can't go around the boulder because then you'd be off of the side of the trail and the side of the trail is, is that's the end. Like there isn't another story after that. So I, I took some rocks and I started to build up what I call a bridge, right? A, a ramp up to get to the top of the big rock and a ramp down to get on the other side thinking that's my only option. I mean, there's this giant boulder on the side of the trail. I can't go around it, I have to go over it. Now, if you had maybe, I have 33 inch tires, that wouldn't mean much to most of you, but if you had 35 inch tires or a, a, an even higher suspension, maybe you could have just rolled over that rock and not got hung up. But as I built this bridge and I tried to overcome the rock, even before I got on top of the rock, my front end got hung up on the rock. So I couldn't even get up it let alone over it. So if I had gotten over it, I surely would have gotten hung up and then I would have been even in more trouble. So I backed up and as I backed up, the front end actually grabbed the rock and drug it into the middle of the trail. This giant boulder, I mean, 
It's, it's probably as tall as this speaker and as wide, maybe a little bigger. There's no way I can move it, it's too heavy. I, I had like a shovel and an ax, but you know, those were gonna break if I tried to do anything with that. So my only option, or, or standing there, I started to contemplate, what are my options? You can't go backwards, you can't turn around. There's no cell service. There's nobody even on this trail. I'm not sure if panic set in, but I, I certainly started to have an elevated heartbeat, I think. Um, I, I started to imagine, how would I explain to my wife that my truck is on the side of a canyon wall in Wyoming? I, I contemplated, well, I've got enough water here. I, I could hike my way back out. I was probably four or five miles in at that point. And while it would be hot, in the mountains, it's not as hot as it is here. And so, you know, temperatures were, weren't as extreme. And so I could get back to where people were. And then, I don't know, I couldn't call an Uber, but, you know, we'll figure something out next when we find somebody to get help. And, but still, the truck's sitting on the side of the, the canyon wall. So what do we do? And, you know, to, to be, uh, for the record, I, I have video footage of this whole episode. I didn't bring it for you tonight. But I didn't get angry. I didn't cuss. But my ego quickly crumbled. My sense of self-reliance was torn away. I remember becoming very disappointed in myself for letting myself get into this situation. You're on the side of a canyon wall. There's no way to go back. There's no way to go forward. You're all alone. What were you thinking? Standing here now looking back, I can see a pattern that's inherent in every man, every boy. We're all asking ourselves the same question. Do you have what it takes? And so we, in life, set up these little challenges, and then we accomplish them, and then we, as we grow into young men, we, we, we stretch ourselves, we, we stretch our boundaries, we go for a little bit more and a little bit more. But eventually, if you keep going on that path, there's a high likelihood that failure will enter in. This flesh, as the Word of God says, will eventually fail us. And can I tell you, that's by God's design. He's designed us in a way that will fail. My heart and my flesh fail it. God could have made us better. He could have equipped us with more stuff, more capabilities. He could have given us the spiritual authority to, to do things without having to learn how to handle that spiritual authority. You see, tonight, the point of failure in our lives is, is actually a door that opens up to something that can't actually come through continued success. This book, the Bible, it's filled with failures. And God has consistently used men and women who failed, who then later go on to do great exploits. Would you consider Moses a failure? The man who spoke face to face to God was a murderer. The man who parted the Red Sea, then hid in exile for 40 years as a shepherd, always looking over his shoulder wondering if Egypt was still coming for him. The man of God who the man who God gave the law to on the mountaintop tried to give God excuses why he couldn't be used of God. He's slow of speech and didn't know his name. And What failure in your life has deemed you so disqualified you from being used of God? Would you consider David a failure? A man who's after God's own heart was an adulterer. A man who was anointed as a boy to be king was a liar and a murderer. A man who was inspired by God to write the many psalms was a corrupt politician. What about the Apostle Peter? Was he a failure? Turn your Bibles, if you would, with me to Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Luke chapter 22, and verse 54. Here we have uh, the scenario where Jesus has been taken captive. He's, he's literally in the shadow of the cross where he would die to pay the price for my sin and your sin. And, and here we read about another failure. Luke chapter 22, verse 54 says, Then they took him and, and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled the fire in the midst of the hall, 
they were set down together. Peter sat down among them. So, so Peter sees Jesus taken captive, and, and he, he finds a place in the crowd that's in that area to, to kind of keep an eye on what's going on, to try to be apprised of the situation. Um, but, but not so much in front of the situation that people recognize him for who he is. And so as he's sitting around the fire with all these other people who, who were part of the party that, that put Jesus on trial, and when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, they were sat down together. Peter sat down with them, and a certain maid beheld him and sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. I recognize him. I've seen him with this Jesus. And verse 57 says, and he denied him, saying, woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, thou art also them of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. You've got the wrong guy. And about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth, this, is, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while yet he spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned. So there was some proximity here. He was close enough to see Jesus but far enough away not to be associated with him. And, and as he's sitting around the fire, the cock crows and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And failure set in. Complete and utter failure as Peter went out and wept bitterly, realizing the failure that he had become. When just moments earlier, Peter's telling God what, with what great confidence he would follow Jesus even unto the death, saying he would defend him no matter what happened. But now he's standing in a total and utter failure. Even having, after having been warned by Jesus is that you're going you're gonna to trip up and fall, and he's like, no, Lord, not me. Pride cometh before a fall. Arrogance and self-will will get in the way, and then self-preservation kicks in, and Peter fails. A total failure. You see, success breeds pride. Success produces arrogance. Success produces a, a self-centeredness with a puffed-up chest that says, look at me. But failure doesn't produce any of those things. Rather, failure produces humility. Failure produces selflessness. Failure creates a greater reliance on God rather than on oneself. Failure produces things that success will never produce. Oh, I know our obedience produces blessings, and I want those blessings. I want those promises, and God will give me those promises because they're in his word, and he cannot lie. And while I'm not going to sign up for failures, I recognize that failures produce more change in life than successes do. Failures produce more in one's life than blessings do. I wish I could tell you differently. I wish there was another way to go. But the hardest things you go through in life will likely be the things that produce the most in you spiritually. Not the good times, not the, the blessings, but the challenges, the failures even in life. That's why as a mature Christian, as we go through our walk with God, when we look back at what the Lord has done in our lives, what he's built in this temple, we start to thank him for the failures that we've been through, for the challenges that we faced and failed miserably at. It's through this process of failure that allows us to glory in our weakness. See, success would never allow that to happen. If you turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, the Bible says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So you can't claim that glory and weakness until you recognize that weakness is what produced the better outcome, where failure opened a door that success never would. Perhaps tonight you're struggling with something and, you, and you, you're really needing some hope in your life. If you turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we read about this process, how God uses failure to produce things that just wouldn't come any other way. Things like patience, 
that leads to experiences which leads to a greater hope. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. See, we have this belief that God is looking out for me, that he's, he's got my back, that he's going to deliver me. But then when we go through situations and we actually see it happen, our faith increases. We start to glory in the situations and challenges we face because we saw the deliverance of God in them. It says that here's this process. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given us. But you can't have that hope unless you go through some tribulation, some challenges, some failures even. See, in our, our minds, we only see failures as bad. And we see success as good. But God is so good at being God, he, he can use our failures to produce something good that can't be produced through success. He's so good at being God, he can use our shortcomings to his advantage to see his will come to pass. We heard a, in a message in Tongues and Interpretation a few weeks ago that, that he's in, the one in the storm. He's so good at being God, he does storms well. God knows how to produce something that in us that would not come out of times of plenty or blessings galore. But on our scorecard, we, we, we start to tally up the failures and the successes. And through our failures, we assume that our inadequacies then disqualify us from being used by God to do anything. But actually, the opposite is true. It's through our inadequacies, our shortcomings, the door of failure that God can use us as a vessel to pour out an even greater blessing. John chapter 12 and 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Failure opens a door as we shift from self-reliance to reliance on God. Failure opens a door as we move from being caught up in the pride of life to humbling ourselves before God. Can I be honest? I didn't want to preach this message tonight. I would rather tell you about my great exploits and adventures. We'd all much rather put on display the, the successes and show off our good qualities. Let me tell you about my ministry. Let me tell you about the good things that I do at the church. Let me tell you how much I prayed this week. And God says, well, that's nice, but I, I can't work very much with successes. Do you have some failures that you could share with me? Do you have some situations that you can't overcome that you need some help with? So how do you walk through the door of failure tonight? Well, it happens when we face our failures head on, when we, we recognize that we've messed up, we've gotten ourselves in a situation, we, we let go of some things we shouldn't have let go of, whatever it might be. It happens on an altar of repentance. It happens when we, like Peter, realize that we, what we've done, and in te with tears of repentance, we bitterly cry out to God asking for forgiveness because his strength is made perfect in weakness. If the musicians would come tonight and if you'd stand with me. I realize I, I've left some unanswered questions in my story. Well, I'm here tonight. So you know that much. What did happen on the side of the canyon? Why did my plans change from 13 days to 10 days? And how did, how did I ever get around that boulder? Well, I can tell you the FJ is parked at home. It still runs. The rocks did do some modifications in certain places. The tree branches, they call that pinstriping on the trail lingo. <laughs> I can show you how to get some if you'd like. And I can tell you the version of the story that, that pats me on the back and puffs up my chest, but that wouldn't be an accurate representation of what really happened. In short, God had his hand on me even when I foolishly put myself in an impossible situation. 
See, God can use our shortcomings to his advantage. God helped me move the obstacle. He helped me climb the side of the canyon. He helped me through what was yet another 14 miles of incredibly rocky, difficult terrain to get back on the pavement 12 hours later, exhausted mentally and physically. And then I rolled down the hill literally for an hour and a half to the city where the gas station was. Not literally, but you realize gravity actually helps and doesn't consume as much fuel. And so, God, you knew. And then as I continued on my adventure with some much tamer trails, I promise you, I'll never do that again or anything like it. I realized that my body was tired, I was weary, I, I was no longer yearning for adventure. And so I, I just called my wife and I told her I was coming home. I don't need to go on a backpacking trip for four more days. I've done enough physical and mental damage. And you know what? God answered my question on day one. And even when we put ourselves in a situation like I did, he used it to, to break down some things, to rearrange some things that just, well, voluntarily wouldn't have been accomplished. Tonight, I don't know what your failures are or what you've experienced, but I don't need to know because we've all gotten ourselves into situations that we didn't intend to. And it's not through our own ability that we're going to find our way out. There's only one way, and it's through the door of facing our failures. Through a door of repentance. When we cry out to God, exposing our failures and being transparent, saying, God, here, here's the real deal. Asking him for forgiveness, asking him for help. Tonight, we, we all likely have some thing we did or didn't do that in our mind keeps us from becoming what God would want us to become. We've disqualified ourselves like Moses. Well, I've killed a man. How could I lead your people? David, I, I've set a man up for death and committed adultery. How could I be a man after your own heart? God, I've denied you three times and you even warned me I was going to do it. How could you give me the keys to the kingdom? But you see, God can do more with failure that he can do with success. He's not looking for your abilities. He's looking for you to... It's by design. It's by God's intent. He didn't make us better because then we would become self-reliant, self-centered, self-focused. But tonight, as we open up this altar, wherever you are in this sanctuary, we all have failures. We all have situations. But instead of putting them in the corner, instead of trying to cover them up with a nice suit, instead of ignoring them, God is saying, would you just bring it to the surface? Would you, would you just bring it to the center? And it, would you just let me use it as a door to allow you to walk through it into something that can't come any other way. When he hung on the cross, he paid for all of my sins, past, present, and future. And so tonight, there's a door for each and every one of us to bring him our failures, our shortcomings, our inabilities, Jesus, we need you tonight more than ever before. The altar is open.